Hello and welcome to League of Women Voters Presents. I'm Jim Robertson and our discussion tonight is going to be on the war on poverty 50 years later. My panelists, our panelists tonight, are on the far right, my far right, Jeanette Mox, Mott Oxford. She's executive director of the Missouri Association for Social Welfare. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, psycho psychologist Wiley Miller. Thank you. Hello. And Dr. Tracy Griever Rice. She's director of the Social and Economic Data Analysis at the University of Missouri. Thank you for being here and sharing your expertise with us tonight, panelists. The uh, War on Poverty. LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, declared war on, at his inaugural speech in 1964, I believe. 65, it would have been. But uh, 50 years later, what can we say about the war on poverty? Are we winning? How has the face of poverty changed in those 50 years? Jeanette, let's start with you. Well, certainly poverty is all too common still. So many say, oh, uh, it's been a waste of time. But it hasn't when you look at the change uh, in, uh, in demographics. Uh, the poverty rate was about 26% uh, 26 nationally in 1964, and it's more like 16% now. Uh, the gains were especially strong in the first decade, uh, but unfortunately, recently we've had uh, a widening gap uh, between the rich and the poor, uh, wages being stagnant, and uh, uh, also um, a lot of resistance to some of the programs uh, that have helped in the past. Uh, we've seen especially a large uh, drop in the number of elderly people who are poor, um, and uh, there were expansions to the Social Security program, which of course started in 1935, but was expanded in the 1960s uh, with increases in benefits and increases in the minimum benefit especially. And um, right now, 44.4% of seniors would be poor without Social Security. Uh, and with Social Security, it's only 9.1%. So uh, the helping programs created through the War on Poverty have had a great effect, at least for some populations, the elderly probably being chief among them. Mm -hmm. How does the econom economic cycles, how do they affect uh, the levels of poverty? Um, Tracy? Or, sure. Uh, um, as you might expect, the um, uh, economic cycles do impact uh, levels of poverty, um, more, more people, particularly who are middle income people, families with children, um, fall into poverty when the economy goes down, when um, job losses occur. Um, the percent of children living in poverty um, in the United States right now under six is around 25 percent, so a quarter of kids grow up in, in households that are, are very poor. And there's been an increase in, in what the Census Bureau and those who measure poverty consider to be very poor, and that's families living in households that are less than half of the poverty level. So in 2014, the, um, the uh, poverty level for a family of four, it was declared to be a, almost $24,000 a year, 23850 And that's reevaluated and calculated every year. It's consistent across the continental United States, and of course we know various places have higher and lower costs of living. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's also calibrated by household. So there's a level set whether a household is one, two, or more people. Um, so there's some variation in that, but certainly kids um, bear the brunt of poverty in the current policy environment. Right. Well, the, the uh, even the, the, the makeup, the definition of a, not the definition maybe, but the makeup of a household has changed pretty drastically since uh, uh, 1964, hasn't it? I mean, there are a lot more uh, single parent households. Yeah, female headed single family households are the poorest of types of households mm -hmm. consistently. How does that, what effect does that have on, on families? Well, um, uh, it depends. Uh, one uh, problem, of course, we have is that uh, women tend to earn at a lower rate uh, than do men uh, and tend to be concentrated in um, professions and other occupations that pay at a lower rate. So uh, with the women-headed households, there is a great tendency for there to be less income uh, for the family uh, when there's no male involved. Um, but I wanted to go back to your earlier question regarding uh, what's happened over the past uh, 50 years of the uh, 
uh, War on Poverty program. Uh, it, it has um, ebbed and flowed, uh, really, over that period of time. Uh, it, um, it didn't take long at all for the, um, uh, the War on Poverty to come under attack itself. Uh, by the end of the 60s, there was quite an attack uh, on President uh, Johnson's uh, uh, program. And of course, we had the Vietnam War which, uh, at the same time, which was distracting from the, uh, uh, from the uh, war on poverty. And when you talked about the war, we had to distinguish which war we're talking about, because it could be either Vietnam or it could be the war on poverty. Well, we got into the 70s, of course, and uh, um, there was a change uh, in administrations, a uh, change in uh, policies, change in attitude uh, toward uh, poverty programs, and a number of the initiatives uh, um, uh, begun under President uh, Johnson were uh, modified or even reversed. Uh, that was getting into the uh, Nixon uh, administration. Uh, and that sort of thing continued to happen uh, over the years. Uh, with, um, with changes in uh, um, administrations. Uh, we would get an emphasis uh, upon um, uh, doing something about poverty, and then that emphasis would be um, reduced or, uh, uh, or um, ended uh, altogether. So it's been uh, a mixed uh, response, I would say, over the uh, 50 years. It is true that, uh, no doubt, we are far better off uh, as a consequence of the war on poverty than we would have been without it. But we haven't done nearly as much as could have been done had the effort been sustained uh, from the outset. And, and I, I see you agreeing. In, in what ways uh, are we better off? Well, uh, as I said earlier, the poverty rate among elders has is, is declined significantly. Uh, there are programs that show uh, remarkable successes, like the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, commonly called WIC. Mm -hmm. We save $4 in health care costs for each dollar that we spend on food uh, in that program uh, by reason that when a pregnant woman or a nursing woman, a very small child, has good nutrition, you have uh, a drop in things like infant mortality, a drop in low birth weight babies, uh, less time spent in the natal intensive care unit means a great savings to the taxpayers. So um, that program has been uh, very successful. Uh, certainly, um, diseases connected to malnutrition have dropped significantly in our country uh, thanks to food stamps. Uh, food stamps is now pro uh, providing nutritional support for about one out of six Missourians and around uh, 49 million Americans um, across the nation. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of folks be able to go th uh, to college uh, through Pell Grants. Um, so uh, a lot of things have been changed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the doctor to my left has, uh, is, is correct that the ebb and flow uh, has created some terrible drag the other direction as well. Uh, in 1996, when the welfare reform law was being debated, uh, the, the GAO uh, predicted that it would cause a rise in uh, childhood um, poverty, and President Clinton had promised he wouldn't sign it if that, if that was going to be true, but he went ahead and signed it. Uh, and uh, in the decade uh, since uh, 1996, uh, that's been measured, uh, children living in extreme poverty, meaning less than $2 per person per day, uh, has gone up 130%. So some groups have really been helped uh, where the, the programs have been carried out more robustly, you might say, uh, but where there's been uh, cutbacks or uh, attacks on programs that uh, serve families with very low incomes, we have sometimes seen startling statistics like that. 130% increase in children living in extreme poverty. Right, and I, to um, sort of validate your, your point, and very interestingly, children um, in households receiving TANF, the mm -hmm. temporary need for, uh, temporary assistance for needy families, which was welfare reform instituted in 96, mm -hmm. um, has dropped down to about 4.7%, while children receiving childcare assistance and on food stamps um, is up around 40%. So a change in policy can make a tremendous difference, you know, and if you're qualified for food stamps, chances are good you're in a household that prior to 96 would have qualified for TANF. Mm -hmm. TANF is the program with a 60-month overall lifetime limit, so people cycle in and, on it, in and off of it. Tracy, you, we were talking earlier about uh, the school lunch program, mm -hmm. free and reduced lunch. Um, people, some, and it's a political issue, 
uh, is it expansion or is it a, a greater um, need? And you addressed that earlier. It was very interesting. Sure, it's it's a little bit of both, um, and it's important to remember that when we use these um, administrative program numbers as proxies for understanding what's happening with the population, that they're also subject to changing basis, based on changes in the program, which might be totally legitimate changes. So with free and reduced lunch, which has been a um, long held, probably 20, 25 years um, proxy for childhood poverty, um, the changes in that program are gonna make that a less valuable measure. So we need to be prepared for how to talk about childhood poverty and not rely on that, on that program. But essentially what happened is, to make sure that children are appropriately covered, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, who runs free and reduced lunch program, um, changed the rules about how states must qualify kids to participate in the program. So prior to this year, 2014, um, essentially, if a family wanted to participate, they took the permission slip that came home and they signed it and um, provided some documentation of their household income. The law has changed so that states must use their administrative record systems for Medicaid, for TANF, for the SNAP program, previously known as food stamps, and look at those and then tell districts, these are your kids who are qualified, and families essentially opt out. Well, that has caused what looks like a huge increase right. um, when we use it as a proxy for poverty. Some of it is, is truly poverty. You could say that it's recognizing or correcting for um, inappropriate lack of participation, um, but it's it's the blip is artificial due to an administrative change. Yeah, and that that will be sustained. One right. Would think, right. Yes, as long as they keep program levels at the same level. R right. right. Which is but, the, but that always in doubt. Huh? The, yes. The, yeah. The free and reduced price lunch program illustrates how many of these programs are sort of um, political popularity contests in a way, because there's a lot more support in, in a bipartisan fashion for school lunches, because we're talking about children. So there, the program serves up to 225% of the poverty level, and that's a more accurate measure of where poverty really is, since our, our, the way we measure poverty itself is a very uh, outdated kind of, of, of figure. Um, but here in Missouri, we, for Medicaid, we will only serve uh, adults up to 18% of the poverty level, which is less than $300 a month. Uh, the, one of the stingiest guidelines for Medicaid in the country, and, and uh, you know certainly ch childless adults at this point that, that aren't disabled can't qualify for Medicaid at all. We have a chance to do something about that, and I hope that we will uh, this leg legislative session. But uh, um, there, you know, is the the popularity of one group versus another. Uh, as I said earlier, Social Security helps elders. We really have a feeling in our hearts for elders, I guess, and for children, but when it comes to uh, adults, uh, the the sentiment is sort of, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps to, to quote the familiar phrase. Mm -hmm. And w what keeps people from doing just that? From pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps? Right. Many things <laughs> contribute to or prevent a person from doing that. Um, it, it, there, there, there are some things we know about uh, poverty and, and about how to end it. Um, uh, the, uh, people who are in poverty, and however defined at this point, we won't, we won't uh, bicker over the uh, definition, but uh, for people in poverty, they typically um, need um, sustained health care. That's one of the basic elements. It's the, uh, another thing that's needed uh, is uh, nutrition. Uh, and um, a third uh, is uh, education, training, literacy. Um, it is rare that we have uh, comprehensive programs designed to address um, uh, poverty uh, in a sustained way. Uh, and uh, this is a result, uh, it seems, uh, of our uh, political uh, ideology that comes into play. Uh, so frequently, uh, there is the thought that uh, um, we have to be very careful or we'll help someone who is undeserving. It uh, doesn't matter that the person is in poverty, uh, he or she is undeserving. Now, how we define undeserving is it's a bit of a mystery, it seems to me. 
uh, but uh, we, we don't want to do that. So we have uh, strict means tests uh, that apply, uh, 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 very difficult for a number of people to meet, uh, people who, uh, who are not high on the uh, literacy scale have difficulty even understanding some of the uh, requirements that, that they have to meet in order to get assistance. The, uh, um, the, the programs can be so complicated that they actually um, um, uh, cause a number of people to, uh, to hesitate to uh, participate uh, in them. So, uh, so there are just a number of, I only named three, there, there, are, there are other factors as well, but those are three of the main ones. Uh, and um, it is, it is just, it's simply very difficult to, um, uh, to have a sustained program to address all of the uh, problems that people in poverty have. I should mention, uh, while I have the floor, I should mention uh, a, uh, a fourth one uh, that certainly gets into the psychological, the psychosocial arena a bit, and that is um, identity. Uh, um, people have a tendency to identify with the group uh, with which they are associated. Uh, and if a person lives in poverty, they have a tendency to think of themselves as poor people. And uh, it is more difficult for them to think that uh, they can do something that will change that, uh, that existence. Uh, it, it, it takes a, a good deal of work to bring about a shift in attitude, a shift in identity, so that the person feels that uh, going to school, uh, getting training, uh, promoting him or herself can really pay off in the, in, in the final analysis. Can be done, but it takes a lot of work. When President Johnson declared war, it's, it seemed to me that he was concentrating a lot on rural areas mm -hmm. where the extremely mm -hmm. poor mm -hmm. uh, were. And it, it also seems to me that that has shifted from rural areas to inner cities mm -hmm. in large part. What's, uh, is that a, a failing of policy? Is it just a natural flow of people? What, uh, what happened? <clears throat> And the poverty rate is still incredibly high in rural counties, uh, especially here in Missouri, the poorest part of our state continues to be the southeastern mm -hmm. uh, counties that are largely rural. Um, the, the rates are as high there as they are in the city. It's just there's a concentration of people in the city. So yes, in raw numbers, uh, there's a lot more poor people in, say, St. Louis and Kansas City, um, Jackson County. Uh, but uh, um, when, when it comes to percentage in a county, that have low incomes, the, the rural areas are just as high as the urban areas. Mm -hmm. and, and, and no wonder, I mean, when we look at the raw barriers to getting out of poverty, uh, if the jobs are 30 miles away and you have no car, um, if the affordable childcare is 15 miles in the other direction from where that job is, it's 30 miles away, you've got a real, you've got a real challenge to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the things that's concerned the Missouri Association for Social Welfare is that some of the Medicaid proposals this year have had work requirements in them that may be impossible to meet for people that live in areas with high unemployment uh, if there are folks who have no resources to get to where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly agree that the, uh, the poverty um, in rural areas remains very high. Uh, at the same time, however, um, we have had for some time um, a shift in um, populate, location of po population, shift in demographics. Um, we've, we've had the migration from the uh, rural areas to urban areas. Uh, and that was already underway um, uh, uh, when uh, President Johnson uh, uh, started the uh, war on poverty. They had been underway. Uh, was a post -World yes, War II. a post World War II, mm -hmm. exactly. So that had been underway for quite some time, but uh, it accelerated uh, during the 50s, uh, and certainly by the 60s uh, was beginning to um, uh, change the, the face of the, the country, and it continued to do so. But uh, there was an awful lot of poverty uh, in the rural areas back in the early 60s, Appalachia, for example, uh, being one of the uh, major focus points. Um, but we, we did have, as, as opportunities um, disappeared uh, in the rural areas, uh, people did migrate 
uh, to the urban areas uh, of the uh, country. And um, uh, people going into these areas without much in the way of education and skills and abilities um, uh, took poverty with them. And so we had an increase uh, in the uh, poverty rates uh, in our urban areas as well. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a very complex story, and um, I agree with this, with these, what you've been describing. But there's another facet facet of it that's kind of interesting to think about also, and that, you know, folks folks who stayed in rural areas were typically the least able to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't stand very choice; true. they stayed mm -hmm. being the least able to leave, and. Um, to this day, in addition to the Boot Heel and the Central Ozarks, which is a very poor part of not just Missouri, but the country, and the northern tier of Missouri County, some of which have less than 2,000 people in them, mm -hmm. um, poverty uh, plays an important role in what remains of the local economy. Many of those counties have more than half of their income that comes in from entitlement payments, and so you know, it's a it's a system that, in a way, feeds feeds on itself. Those entitlement payments in the forms of social security and supplemental security income and various programs, and as well as public dollars, um, many of which are providing services to people through local governments, county health departments, public education, um, are the primary sources of income. So, you know, poverty can be <laughs> poverty. Alleviation is an economic driver in poor areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Food stamps provides about $120, $120 million dollars a month uh, in Missouri, a money that's spent in our grocery stores and winds up, you know, supporting the whole community. Right. So about four dollars a day for each recipient. Right. About a right? dollar thirty yeah. per person per meal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about this notion, that, and this follows up, I think, the, this notion that welfare benefits create dependency mm. and uh, you know that's a, another political argument uh, we shouldn't do it I'd love to see the evidence to support that uh, notion I've yet to see it I haven't seen that any place at all um, people uh, are instilled with motivation uh, they want to do better they simply don't know how to do better or where to do better and uh, the idea that if we um, uh, lend a helping hand uh, to uh, a few people, that is going to stymie their motivation and cause them to simply sit and do nothing uh, is um, a myth uh, that uh, uh, is very destructive, I think. I think if we think about it, you know, T TANF, the, that you mentioned earlier, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, uh, the program most apt to be called welfare, yeah. <laughs> cash, cash payments. Uh, the, the benefit has not gone up in Missouri since 1991, so it's $292 a month for a family of three. It went up $3 in 1991 from where it was in 1975. So the benefit has not been growing, and uh, the claim is what you said. You know, if we make these benefits bigger, well, people will just flock to this program because folks just want to stand and let the government take care of them. But how much ambition do you have in your life if your goal is to get $292 of cash and another 300 and some odd dollars in food stamps, and that's all you have? Now, the Cato Institute would tell us, oh, no, you get uh, this package of stuff that equals about $30,000 a year, so why not just sit around and take it? But that's a deeply flawed study because, you know, for example, they assume everyone gets subsidized housing uh, of, of families on TANF in Missouri. Um, uh, only a little more than 15% get subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite rare to get everything on that list. So they, they assume that everybody gets every benefit exactly. available. Yeah. yeah, and that we all get WIC, whether we have a child under five yeah. or not, or a pregnant woman, you know, that we get it all. Well, no, people don't get it all. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the income guidelines are so strict that we generally cut people off of help, oh, about $10,000 a year before they get to the point where they can afford things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is, is poverty at this point uh, intractable? I mean, given the political climate, uh, given the realities of, uh, of, of life today, how, how do we make more uh, progress? Well, some are trying, certainly. Um, 
and the efforts are being made. Um, we have a, a great tendency to respond uh, uh, when need is very great. We, we, we have a tendency to, in, in our society, to respond to crises. So if, uh, if things get bad enough, uh, then uh, we will come in with um, uh, at least a partial effort to do something about the problem uh, until um, uh, the problem subsides. Uh, one of the uh, uh, observations that's made is that the, uh, the war on poverty has actually been uh, so successful that uh, it uh, uh, undermined uh, itself, it, 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 it hurt itself because um, so many people uh, benefited that um, we have uh, fewer people in need now and the, the people who, uh, who did benefit don't quite realize that it was um, the, the effort of those programs, the, the result of the war on poverty programs that actually brought them to the economic status that they enjoy today. So um, they are not necessarily uh, as supportive uh, of these efforts for the remaining people in poverty as they should be. So we don't have as much support for those programs as, as we ought to have, but uh, it's a matter of bringing um, uh, to the uh, awareness of uh, everyone, I, I suppose, that um, these uh, programs are vitally important and really benefit the entire society. It's not a matter of benefiting just a few people in poverty. If we lift people out of poverty, they become consumers. They become taxpayers. Uh, it benefits all of us. They become contributors. Uh, it that it seems intuitive, but uh, <laughs> it's not always the case for a lot no, of it people. Isn't. No, it isn't. Yeah. It is very hard, I think, for people to recognize the, um, the role of policy around poverty and how it extends throughout um, a community or a culture. I think Head Start is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we would have, you know, we, we wouldn't be having a conversation about universal early childhood education if the Head Start program hadn't been put into place to help um, mm -hmm. children young children in poverty to begin with. Now it's considered the norm to um, provide children under five with regular early childhood education. There's a time that we felt hopeless about polio as well, so I think it's about a matter of political will. What do we want to uh, focus on and put our full attention and full array of resources toward and what do we not? Uh, so I, I think that poverty could end if we agreed that it would. Uh, and uh, um, it, it certainly would improve the quality of life for all of us uh, if, if, we didn't, uh, if we didn't have poverty. There are places in the world that don't have much, a great deal more economic activity per capita than, than we do where there aren't poor people. I mean, policy, from a policy perspective, you can share resources in a way that everyone gets to live a reasonable, safe, um, productive life. Mm -hmm. We choose not to do that. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that. We're out of time. I uh, appreciate you all three being here, and it's given us some very good food for thought. Uh, 50 years and the war goes on. So thanks to the panelists. Thanks to you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>